What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the fourth installment of Peeling Back a Layer, where we discuss fundamental concepts that we often think we know the answer to, that we're truly under misunderstanding on a fundamental level, and making errors in the way we think or approach our training or nutrition. So, we're going to take an outside-of-the-box look today at a question that might surprise that I'm even asking. And the question is, can I apply research to my diet and training? Now, I know what you're thinking. Eric, your entire career has been built on taking an evidence-based scientific method approach to bodybuilding. So how could we even bring up the question of, can we use research to approach bodybuilding? And I think it's important that I place a little bit of context before I dive into uh, the details of this episode. First. Yes, you can, of course, use research, but most people use it in a way that is sometimes even counterproductive and downright wrong. And the reason is that they don't have a fundamental understanding of the way research reports its results and how it is therefore should be interpreted, and it's often misinterpreted because of that. So today we're going to look at one specific study and I'll send the, I have the actual link to the PubMed article in the comments below. And we're going to talk about some of the conclusions and results of this study and what they actually might mean instead of the way most people would interpret them uh, to mean and therefore be applied. All right? So let's get the camera nice and shaky to piss you guys off and go to the board. All right. So... I'm referring specifically to a study that was recently done called the Snapshot of Nitrogen Balance in Endurance Trained Women. So just so we understand what we're talking about, nitrogen balance is a way of measuring a protein requirement. That means the, basic, the, the minimum amount of protein you need to not lose nitrogen, and nitrogen is present in protein, meaning the minimum amount of protein you need to consume in order to not be losing body protein, essentially. Okay. Now in this study, they had a whole bunch of endurance trained uh, female cyclists and they had them on a couple of different diets, a normal protein diet and then a high protein diet. And they tracked, um, you know, basically their protein needs uh, during uh, some periods of intense training, uh, endurance training. Now how the study was conducted doesn't matter too much. Uh, the results is not what we're going to focus on a whole lot, rather the interpretation of those results. All right. So the first thing they report is the mean average protein requirement in the subjects in this study. So that means is they figure out each one of these subjects' nitrogen balance requirements for protein, and then they average them. So they divide it, you know, add them all together and divide it by the number of subjects. So if there's 20 people, they add all of their different uh, protein intakes together and divide it by 20. And they found the average requirement for endurance trained women in a high um, you know, a period of, of hard training is about 1.63 grams per kilogram, which for you Americans out there, my fellow Americans, is 0.74 grams per pound. Then they go on to report a really good statistic uh, called a confidence interval. Uh, however, most people aren't familiar with this if you're not involved in research or statistics. So they said the 95% confidence interval means shows that it is a 1.1 to 3.8 gram per kilogram requirement for these athletes. So I know what you're saying. You're going, wait, 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 what does that mean? I thought it was 1.63. And that is what most studies report, the mean. However, that average includes a whole bunch of individual data pieces, each one of those individual subjects in the study with different protein requirements, and the average is 1.63. However, what a 95% confidence interval means is that we have, with 95% confidence, we can say there's only a 5% chance of us being wrong about this, this is the range of protein requirement that the true population that this study is meant to represent theoretically should have. So that means if we were to take every single endurance trained woman in the world, um, and then we figured out the, their mean uh, protein requirement, it should fall with 95% confidence within this range. That's what we can know based on the variability and the distribution of the data in this based on the number of subjects we had. And you're going, whoa, that is a really broad range. That's 0.5 to 1.7 grams per pound, or 1.1 to 3.8 grams per kilogram. That's either pretty damn low, pretty damn high, or somewhere in between. 
And that's quite confusing to some people. Now, the reality is, is that these are probably the far end possibilities. And if you change this to a 90% confidence interval, meaning you allowed for another 5% chance of being wrong, these numbers would become a lot tighter. So the more confidence you have, or the more sure, sureness you want to have in this statistic, the broader the range, and the smaller the confidence interval, the tighter the range, okay? But what this means is that we only know an estimation of what should be uh, the, the average of the overall population with just the mean. But the, the actual average of the population might be anywhere within here. Now what this does not mean, and it's often misunderstood to mean, is that the individual's requirement falls between here. That means you grab any random person off the planet who's an endurance trained woman and their protein requirement will fall between here and here. That's not actually what this is. This is the true, this is the value of the true population that this is meant to represent their mean. Okay? So stay with me. The last and extremely important thing that this study did, if you read the full text, is they reported an individual requirement of one of the athletes. This is not the average, this is not the norm, and one might even argue it's an outlier. However, there was one specific individual among all the people in this study who had an individual, her, her requirement, just on her own, was 2.8 grams per kilogram of protein. Now this is extremely high. And if, if someone online said, hey, I, I'm an endurance athlete, I'm taking in 2.8 grams per kilogram, there would be a whole bunch of people who would jump all over and go, oh, that's way too high, 2.8 grams per kilogram, there's no studies that support that. And that is where the crux of this whole video comes from. People are using these numbers to tell individuals whether they're wrong or right when they consume uh, you know, a certain amount of macronutrients, do a certain number of sets, have a certain training frequency, have a certain macronutrient intake, etc. When the reality is, is that studies almost always report the mean. And most people are going to be close to the mean. However, there are plenty of people, full standard deviations of people, that are outside of, uh, of the mean. And even when we are reporting the mean, it, we don't necessarily know if it's the true mean of the population, which probably has a much broader range than is acknowledged by the average uh, abstract that you read in papers. So, can we take a study and simply use the means that are reported in it to define our uh, training and nutritional approaches? Not that definitively. You used studies to guide the broad strokes. You use a study to figure out what's the probable range that I should have my, my macronutrients within, and then you have to use individual tracking over time. You have to see how do I respond, what are my requirements, what do I do best on. Take repeated measures of yourself in different conditions, only changing one variable, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of focus and a lot of trial and error to figure out what is the best approach for you. Now that doesn't just mean Ah, uh, it works for me, bro. I feel better on higher protein or something like that. It means actually recording data, tracking your, your, your performance, tracking your weight loss, maybe even tracking pictures so you can get an idea of your body, body composition changes, and then also making sure that it wasn't just a fluke, that you try this a number of times, just changing that one variable. And this is what we do. This is what we do with our athletes. Because we know that these people are out there. They're real. Not everyone needs to be really close to the mean. And most of the time, if someone needs coaching, it's often because the average approach or the normal approach doesn't always work for them. So they might actually be that outlier. So you have to be open-minded and broad thinking and truly understand research to apply it. So yes, read those studies, use them to apply your broad strokes, but always realize there's a high degree of individual variability in each person.